Ladies and gents, I'm excited to introduce to you my next guest on the Born to Made podcast. His name is Jason Wakob. He is the founder and co-CEO of Mind Body Green, which is an unbelievable media company um, in, that focuses solely on the wellness space. They talk about everything from fitness to nutrition to just living better life. Um, and he happens to be an incredible guy, uh, amazing entrepreneur. Um, and we get really deep into his story. He talks about his life as an athlete um, that parlayed into life on Wall Street for a little while and then ultimately landed him in his role as the founder of Mind Body Green. Super inspirational story, really great bites in there for you to chew on. Uh, can't wait for you to check it out. What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Borner Made podcast. Um, I am excited and fired up to introduce my next guest on the show, Jason Wakab. Um, Jason is the founder and co-CEO of an incredible, incredible company called Mind Body Green, uh, a company and a brand that I love uh, incredibly, incredibly well, and uh, know incredibly well. And um, Jason, welcome. Thanks to be here. It's an honor to be next to you, Michael, for this awesome new podcast. <laughs> um, so quick rundown. What we do here on Born or Made is um, I get the awesome opportunity to meet and hang with guys and gals like you, um, people that uh, have inspired me um, and people that have inspired many, many others. Um, and I, I like to pose the question, though we don't have to get to the question's answer right away, <laughs> but I like to pose the question whether or not you think you were born to be the awesome person you are today, or you had to figure it out, work your ass off, and were made over time? It's both. <laughs> there, there we go. <laughs> There's the answer, ladies and gents. Um, you won't be the first to say that. You won't be the first to say that. But really what I like to do is, so, so it's, it's, a, it's a casual format, man. We just hang, and I would love nothing more than to get your story from as early back as you can go, like first memory style. So really start talking about what it was like to be you as a child um, and how you came up and how you ended up being the awesome dude that you are today. Sure. Wow. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a big question. Let, let me, I'll, I'll try to summarize. And also, why don't you just also give us a quick synopsis of who you are? Sure. Uh, so yes, I am the founder and co-CEO of My Buddy Green. And, and this, this is gonna, my, my answer, I think, is going to hit on a lot of your questions of the nature versus nurture. Uh, so my background, so I'm six foot seven, and maybe you can't see that, but the, the legs are long. <laughs> His legs uh, are about as long as I, my body. <laughs> um, and I, I grew up on Long Island. I just, I'm 45, and, you know, yes, I did play basketball. I played basketball in college. And so, like, going, like going back of, like, the question of who I was, so I grew up on Long Island. Uh, I was raised, actually, by my mother and my grandmother. My parents got divorced when I was three. Um, Do you remember that? No, not really. Like, they, they were separated right before that. So, like, I don't really, there was no dramatic, like, someone moved. I don't, I have no memory of it. So I just knew growing up my father would come. And so. So that, you don't think that, that was, in, that, that, that weighed on your, on your life? No, but I'll, I'll get to, I, I think okay. it definitely played a role in, in who I was. Um, so at any rate, um, grew up, and this was in the, of late 70s, like not a lot of kids' parents were divorced, so like I, I didn't realize it was a thing until like I went to school and everyone had two par parents, but didn't really think much of it. Um, at any rate, like played basketball. Uh, I would say if I were to look at like things that had an impact on who I am today and being the entrepreneur I am, I would say I learned more from playing basketball than I did in the classroom at Columbia or what have you. And I'll, I'll segue to like you know, being a child of divorce and eventually, and then also uh, playing basketball and how, how that all came together. So in my teens, uh, Long Island was not the basketball powerhouse. It, it, it is today, a lot of great guys playing in the NBA now from Long Island. I, I wanted to play, I wanted to get good. I went to the city, so I played at Riverside Church in Harlem and traveled. That was like an eye-opening travel. I traveled with that team. As a kid? As a kid, 15, 16 years old. So like traveled like, you know, we spent a week in Lubbock, Texas when I was 16. 
Uh, so one, if when I go did back you, to... When did you like, realize that you were, you were a prospect in basketball? I was always good. I played everything. I was good at everything. Uh, but basketball, I was very strong. Um, were you always the tallest? Yeah, always. I grew three inches every year until I stopped. So, like, I wasn't, I just grew consistently. And when did you stop? There, around my senior year in high school. So, okay. I'm like six, seven and a quarter, six, seven and change. Um, so, 15, six, so I played varsity as a freshman. We won the Nassau County Championship. Um, and so, that's when I started to get more. That's when I actually, I think, also made the mistake of, of not playing every sport and just transitioned to basketball full time, which, in retrospect, a mistake. Uh, but at any rate, was traveling with that team. So, I spent, <clears throat> I was the only white kid. Oh, excuse me, there's one other, two white kids that are the, uh, of, of two traveling teams. Mm. One's to Lubbock, Texas. So one, it was an eye-opening experience for two reasons. One, um, you know, f around that time, it was like, you know, every once in a while, I'd be like, ah, you know, I feel, not feeling sorry for myself, but, like, I'm the only kid whose parents are divorced. And, like, very quickly, I, there were a bunch of kids I got to know who, you know, some didn't know who their father was, absentee parent, like, I was like, whoa, like, I don't have it bad at all. Did you, um, did you, um, did you, were you the motivation or were you the propeller to push you to really grind hard in basketball or was that something that you, your parents wanted you to do? Sure. I love sports and I think my, my father also played basketball, so in retrospect, I think that was part of it. Our relationship was largely around basketball. Is he uh, tall, too? Yeah, 6'5". Um, so I think that, that played a role. And then later, when my father passed away, I sort of did not care as much. I think a lot, I was going through a lot of things and went to college, and basketball became a lower priority, and drinking became a higher priority. Um, but at any rate, like, realized uh, there was a much bigger world. I grew up in Manhasset, which is a very affluent town. There's a great book, The Tender Bar, which mm -hmm. is about the town of Manhasset. Mm -hmm. the, the guy who wrote Tender Bar actually wrote Agassiz's book, Open. But essentially, he nails Manhasset. Manhasset's the, the, the Catholic church and, and lacrosse and alcohol. Um, and so I, I, I also, at that time, didn't, we weren't, didn't live in the affluent part of town, so I thought we were poor, and then realized I'm traveling with these kids. I'm like, wait, I'm not poor. I'm so lucky. Like, these kids like, really have it tough. So that was like a big awakening for me, like, wow, things are not so bad at all. Not that mm -hmm. I thought they were bad, but provided much-needed perspective of growing up in an uh, upper-middle-class suburban sheltered town sure. with no diversity. Mm -hmm. The other thing I saw in, re in real life was racial, racial profiling. I remember going to a mall and like we were followed. Like I was like, holy shit. Like at a young, I didn't know what was happening, but With like, your team, you mean? yeah, yeah. Like I saw it like, wow, it was a, you know, this is 1990 West Texas. And so like eye opening experience. But at any rate, it was like one of the, one of the other things I learned through basketball. Um, I've been on teams that have been losing adversity. I think when, th when things are going well and you're winning, it's easy to, you know, Every, be a good teammate, pat yourself on the back. Uh, when things are losing, when you're losing and things aren't going well, you kind of know what you're made of. Do you stick together? Do you start to turn on each other? Do you bounce back? Do you play hard? Like a lot of lessons in like winning and losing in teams. Did um, you experience both sides of that on a losing team? Did yeah, so like uh, we, for the most part, we, we won a lot in high school and, and then I went to prep school for a year, but at Columbia, my first two years, for, for, for the first three years, we lost a lot. And I, I Columbia University. Yeah. Um, and then my senior year, we turned it around, and, I, and we were a 50-50 team. We started to win at the end, so like I felt so good about like winning, and I learned a lot. My coach is a guy, Armand Hill, who actually is a, he, he left to... Uh, coach in the NBA with Doc Rivers, so he's with the Clippers now. We mm -hmm. keep in touch, but like he played a huge role in my development. And when I was in college and uh, probably not spending the time I needed to spend on basketball and spending on other things, um, you know, we had a really tough relationship, but ultimately like made me such a better person and a better player, and I learned so much from him. About Were there any learnings that you can point to that you carry with you Today, from a guy like that, I think you know, bouncing back from losing 
you know, was a big thing. Individually, like holding yourself responsible and accountable, mm -hmm. big things. Uh, and at the same time, you know, I've had coaches. I had, I had a coach in high school that was mentally abusive. Like, it's one thing. Some coaches get in your face and stuff. But like, he was mentally abusive. Like, actually, actually, like without a doubt. And it was like a known thing. Yeah, like in retrospect, like in going back, like mentally abusive. So like dealing with did that. Did it fuck you up or did it? Keep it definitely fuck. It definitely took some of the joy out of the game for. Mm -hmm. Was he a good a leader? Years? No. Okay. It was like a different mentality back then. Like, you know, <coughs> just, you know, I have no problem with people being hard on you and like getting in your face and so forth. But like, he would get personal. Yeah. And just terrible. like in a way that like was just mentally abusive. So yeah. definitely, but I, I bounced back from that fine. If you go, going back to your question of like, are you made by experiences? So I would say yes, a big part of it. Um, but with Armand specifically, we get in your face and, and, and get at you, but also like pick you up at that same time. So it was that tough love, if you will. Uh, but, I, but I think a big thing is, is being able to deal with, with losing and, and what that's like and picking yourself up and, and pushing through. Um, so let me just ask you, because I think that's such a good, I, I mean, I. I talk a lot about that too, personally. I think for me, like as an entrepreneur, you know, and I, I think I was born the way I am today. Like I, none of my, not none of my friends, but the large majority of my friends growing up were not thinking the way I was thinking at a young age where I was trying to hustle and make money. Sure. And network and do those things. And so, like, I, I, I mean, I, I do, you know, I do think that there was some level of, um, like, you know, inherent thing that was going on there. However, learning to love, and I know this sounds weird, but, like, learning to love the hard and the hurt has become what makes me uh, sort of not bulletproof but almost impenetrable because <laughs> I'm not afraid and or when I lose, I don't go into the corner, you know? Sure. And so that's something that I care, that I, because I've lost, man. You know what I mean? Sure. And, uh, and we all have. Um, but talk to me about like, your, so your, your, your learnings and losing. Yeah, and so like sports was a big part of it. And then, you know, I lost my father at 19 unexpectedly from a heart attack, age 46. A guy who like looked pretty healthy, looked probably like I do, you know, looked like I do today, maybe a little more gray, but like looked great, boom. And so, you know, for me, I think that framed up a lot of things. And I lost my best friend uh, from an overdose in his 20s. So I lost some people. I know you've experienced a lot. You know, so also you go through something like that, and it's like you say to yourself, well, things aren't, you know, is it really that bad? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so one, you think about gratitude. You think about not taking anything for granted. You think when something bad happens, like how bad is it? Um, when you think about losing, it's, it's you know, to your point, like being in the corner, you know, when the chips are down or someone puts me in the corner, like, I'm, I'm fighting my way out. <laughs> and it's also a balance, too. I think part of the, the secret of successful entrepreneurs is knowing when to fight, knowing when to either pivot or give up or drop it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a balance of like con conviction and, knowing, and intuitively, I think it's like a muscle because you build it up over time and, uh, and also having the ability to take a step back and it's very hard to do and be open to multiple paths and sometimes a, that, that path is one that means like stepping away or giving up or whatever you want to call it. Taking Quitting, giving up. It. Sometimes it's the right thing to do. Knowing when to cut your 100%. losses. Uh, I learned that as a trader. Like it, it's a all part of it. Yeah. All right. So you are traveling in high school. Mm -hmm. and you're on a basketball team, and you guys are doing pretty well. Yeah. And then what happens? So, you know, a, 
a couple things. Uh, one, like culturally, my eyes opened up from living in a predominantly white upper middle class town to all of a sudden, like, I'm playing with, you know, in the heart of Harlem and, and seeing how the rest of the world operates beyond the bubble I live in. Mm -hmm. um, and then, too, like, my, I, my focus was 100% basketball at that time. Like, I didn't really care about anything else. And my junior year, um, I blew out a third degree sprain in my right ankle. And like third degree sprain is, some of them are worse than breaks. Like to this day, my ankle's still like a little messed up. Mm. Um, and so, and through my, my former <laughs> somewhat mentally, not mentally abusive coach, I was pressured to come back too soon. Too soon. And I actually never really healed it. And in that process, I think two things happened. I lost a little bit of like my joy for basketball. And then two, I, my, eyes, my eyes also opened up. Like I need to focus about other things. Like, yeah, this thing happened. Something else could happen. Like I need to think about school again. I need to think maybe I want to have a little bit more Hold fun. Hey guys, there's all sorts of like, it sounds like somebody's dragging chains across the ceiling. And I can't imagine that that's not going to fuck with sound. We are not picking up on our end. Um, OK. It's like very intense on our end, though. <laughs> like, if you were to come in here. It's like crackling noise. I mean, it's never happened before. Really? Do you know what it is? Uh, they're building a WeWork above us. They're still building those? I <laughs> know. Um, okay. So they've been doing construction. And okay. It's kind of like been stopped though. Okay. All right. I promise you. Okay. Okay. Carry on. Okay. So I'll pick up with the joy yeah. piece. So. After that injury, I think I lost some of my joy for the game, and I also started to open my eyes to the idea that this could happen again, and I needed to focus on other things besides basketball. I need to focus on school again. I need to focus a little bit more on having fun, and I actually went the wrong direction, a little too far on that. Um, and so it was a big, I went from the guy who wanted to play you know, and like the ACC or Big East, and I probably could have, but you know, at post injury, well, I, I could have, but I wouldn't have. I would be on the bench. Uh, mm -hmm. Went from that to like, what are, you know, I want to play in the Ivy League, and and that became the the next goal, and then ended up going to, you know, spending a year in prep school. Seamus and I actually went to the same prep school for a year because oh, really? I had yeah, Northfield Mount Hermon. Um, and that was the year, and I had to go because the grades, like, actually, I spent a little too much time having fun, and the grades didn't really catch up as much, so I had to work on that. But that was the year I think I, I really enjoyed playing again, and, like, joy came back to, to playing basketball. You know, it's so interesting. I was just thinking when you were talking about that, like, this thought went through my mind, like, as a real athlete, um, and you were a real athlete, uh, I mean, you're, you weren't like, oh, you know, I love playing basketball. You're like, I want to play in the NBA, athlete. When or I was ACC. younger, when I was younger. When you were, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, Well, in high school, I think I'm more or less like, I want to play in Europe or something. I, I, yeah. But I think when you're thinking that, that way and you have the, like, the truth is, you're, you've got the height, if you've got the skills, there's, a, there's, a, there's like, it all depends on how hard you go and what kind of mentoring you have, right? Well, to some degree. I also learned, so I could jump, but then I also learned the first time I played against Rasheed Wallace, who is retired in the NBA. Mm -hmm. First time I played against him, I realized it wasn't how high you could jump, it was how quick you could jump up and down. I went up once, he was up twice. <laughs> so I also realized that like with, with some, with bat, like specifically like quickness, I can only go so far. And it would never be enough, but height and quick is kind of hard, right? You can't teach height. That's speed that great line that every stuff. coach says. And, and quickness mm -hmm. and speed, I think, to some degree, you can work on it. But you, there is 
a ceiling, I'd say, for speed. Yeah. yeah. yeah and you certainly can't teach height. No, you can't. You can't. But so, so I'm just thinking, like, as I'm thinking through, you know, um, the, like that experience with an injury, you know, for an entrepreneur, and, and that injury, whether it was conscious or subconscious for you, it really sort of trailed you, your, like you just said, even to this day, like you have some stuff with your ankle. Sure, sure. I think for like an entrepreneur in today's climate, right, like a similar thing could be like a real loss, like a, a business just crashing and, and burning, yeah. right? Like it's just like, sure. it, like you'd be, there is like, I, I'll use Saquon Barkley as an example. Sure. He's like an unbelievable football player. He's a, you know, he's, he's a year out of his rookie year. He had an injury early on in the season and at the end of the last season, I, I, it's hard being a New York Giants fan. You're telling me. <laughs> yeah. But at the end of last season, I was like, oh my gosh, we've got hope. I mean, this dude was untouchable. Yeah. He was breaking four tackles every run. Any run that he, any, any rush that he had over seven or eight yards, he had broken three or four tackles. And that's, that's, that's you know, that's a rare thing. He had an injury early on in the season, came back, and like, that was not happening. Mm -hmm. You know, it just wasn't happening. And so I don't know if he's not, I don't know if he's not, able potentially to make the plays he was making or if he has this lack of confidence that he's going to hurt himself again so he doesn't want to go as hard as he was but I think similarly you should have the GM of the Giants on here to discuss he's sticking <laughs> that very question <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. sure but I think similarly in the world of entrepreneurialism you have a loss you know it takes it, it, it it's like it's not easy to just get back in. It, it, it's easy to get back in because that's what you do, but having a, getting back in with the confidence that you had when you were flying high is tough, right? Yeah, I think it's a muscle. You start to build it over time. And so like to your first question, like uh, nature, excuse me, nurture does the experience plays like I am who I am because of all these experiences. They start to add up, whether it's, you know, abusive coach, injury, losing father, another injury, you know, losing, starting businesses that fail, like boom, boom, but they start to add up. You start to build these muscles where, you know, I, I think so much of being successful as an entrepreneur is the, it's a couple of things. One, the willingness to deal with the unknown on a daily basis and being okay with that um, to being able to bounce back from, you know, failures with the big F and the little F like, mm -hmm. and, and like moving on. And then I think three, a big thing is, you know, beyond like, you know, market timing and sizing and, and all of that, like a lot of it does luck, does play a role in that. Like you can't control what's going on in the world and timing is huge. Is this idea of like, <clears throat> I think being emotionally intelligent and and understanding your strengths and weaknesses and being able to like step back every once in a while mm -hmm. and then like take a look at like what's happening and, and and like making that decision like do we are we going further here are we stepping back and so forth and you you never have all the information you even when you get more sophisticated, like there's more information and more data and all that, but the reality is you never have enough. Even with like one thing that I notice on a very regular basis with most any businesses, you know, like you have this document that is called a profit and loss statement. Yes. And you know you're familiar yes. with that, I'm sure. And uh, and this document is it, it really it, it really defines on paper with real numbers what you made, what you spent, sure. and how much money you actually have left. <laughs> you yeah. know? And I think that those, those documents are so, um, they're, they're misleading because you can, if you're looking at it on a, on a, on a period basis or a quarterly basis, um, and you're making decisions on a period basis or a quarterly basis, which some companies do, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's it it it's not it's not right. It's yeah. not fair. Even though this document does say what is it's real. It's tough. It's like the long view is important, but sometimes so so is the short view. 
so again, it's like all context and like, when is this like, are we, a great line from uh, our, our lead investor, this guy, Lou Frankfurt, who's in, he was the CEO of Coach for 30 years. And with regards to like, you know, P&L statement and loss and, and we operate profitably and I believe you have to as a mission driven company because otherwise you can compromise mission, like you must be, period. Mm -hmm. Make bad decisions, bad for mission and so forth. But his line, like... You must you know, be profitable. It, yeah, especially as a mission-driven company. Mm -hmm. Like, if you think about it, like, when you're profitable, you control your destiny. You can make the decisions that are right for the business and right for the mission. When you're not profitable, you don't control your destiny. 100%. And you will most likely be forced to make decisions that are not in the best interest of the brand and the mission. Absolutely. So to me, it's like, no, but you must be. And so one of his great lines, though, around, like, profitability and losing, he said there's a difference between a loss and investing for the future. And there's a difference in a mindset. So like, even though we believe in profitability, it's just like another like nuanced way to, mm -hmm. to look at like a different point of view. All right, so let's get back to your story. So you're sure. now, you know, you, you played in high school, then you got into college, yep. and you played at Columbia. Yes. Um, how was that, how did that feel when you got it? It was great, like, uh, you know, I, I had uh, an unbelievable time. Again, like, basketball, we, we lost a lot. Uh, I think, in retrospect, I took a while to really recover from my father's loss and like drank way too much and partied way too much. Like if I were to rank my priorities at Columbia, it was partying number one and then basketball was three. <laughs> and then four or five was, was, was class. Uh, and I kind of started to get it in the right direction my, my last year. We started to win and it felt good and it, it, was a, it was a great experience. But I definitely, I think, I, I did not, I drank way too much. And, and but you went to school for basketball. I did. And I was just, you know, my, my mentality back then was, you know, I'm here, I'm at Columbia, it'll be good. I'll go to class when I want to go to class. And I just did it. The, and there was <laughs> completely the wrong way. Um, but, but it was a great experience. And then I'd say from there, you know, there were no scholarships, but I had some financial aid, so I walked out with debt. And so... I wanted to, you know, I grew up not having any money and, and not having money, but not being, you know, lower middle class. Mm -hmm. um, wanted to make money, wanted to pay off debt. I, you know, back then there were no startups. Like, so if you went to Columbia back in 1998, you know, if you, if you had an aptitude for science, you went to med school, if you had good grades, you, you know, became a lawyer. And I'd say, if you had none of the above, you went to Wall Street. But I had none of the above. So I'm like, I'm going to be a trader. So... I was, I was an equities trader, um, and it was, I loved it because it was like I was still playing. There was a P&L every day. Mm -hmm. you, were, you were accountable. There was a, a direct correlation, some degree, from effort and success, um, and was fortunate enough to you know, see the boom and do well enough where I could pay off my college debt, buy my mother a car, um, but not enough in any respect to like retire. Like it was just like enough where like the handcuffs were off. Mm -hmm. um, and then 9/11 happened, and like a lot of New Yorkers at the time, that event profoundly changed my view on the world, and started to you know. Like what am I? I started to notice. Like I start to check out. Like in the afternoon, then start to spend more time going away. And I was then finally, I, you know, I was like, what am I doing? Like, there's more to life than just making money. Mm -hmm. And I want to do other things. And um, did you get obsessed with the money when you were there? No, but everyone there it was a culture. It's like think about it. Like the culture of like you want to be the best at what you do, and like the measure of that is how much money you make. Period. Like that was. If you were the best trader, you made the most money. But don't you think, don't you think, so it's interesting, you know, I, we, we also live in a bubble here in New York, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like we just do. I know that through making money as an entrepreneur and hustling my ass off as an entrepreneur and being in New York, the most, you know, hyper competitive market in the world for most any business, specifically my business and hospitality, like they're all through Growing up, my, my sort of um, currency for like success 
was only in the form of money. Like, sure. Like that was like how you were able to define once you know what the word success did not mean anything outside of your financial status, right? Like growing up, that's just the way it was. Like when someone said, "Oh, this person's successful," and I'd be like, "Oh, what kind of car is?" You know, like in my head, I'm like, "Oh, sure. he probably drives a Ferrari." You know what I mean? Sure. Today, I think it's very, very different. I think globally, however, it potentially is not very different when someone is quote unquote successful. Sure. There's a great line from Jerry Seinfeld. I think it was something along the lines of, I like money, but it's not about the money. For the guy who's like still touring, doing stand up and someone doing said shows. something the other day. It's and like, I, I'd say the same I like money, but it's not about the money. I mean, I hear you. But but with trading, for example, like there is no so I bet when you walk into one of your restaurants, no matter what the P and L looks like, which I'm sure that makes you happy talking to a diner and they're like, you know what, this is, these are the best scallops I've ever had. That brings Done. you so much happiness. So they're like, this is the best. Like Done. that, for, when you're in trading and nothing else matters, it's like, here's your P&L. That's nothing it. else matters. Well, There's you know nothing. what's so interesting? I was trying to explain <laughs> this to a friend the other day where I was, and, and, and like, it was so interesting to watch his reaction when I was saying to this. Because in my business, it's very difficult to operate in a restaurant yeah. because the margins are so slim, right? So you, you, you have to understand how to do it. You have to understand how to maneuver in those, in, in specifically in the down months, you have to understand or else you, 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 you go out of business. That's why so many restaurants go out of business because they go and undercapitalize and they don't know how to operate in the mm -hmm. down months and they fail. However, the guest, when the guest walks into the restaurant, there is not a microsecond that that person is contemplating whether or not your P&L is making sense. Like, they're not, they don't walk in and they're, you know, they're, they don't walk in and go, God, I wonder what this P&L of this place yeah. looks like. It never even crosses their mind. And when you run a restaurant business based on what that piece of paper says, it's over. Yeah. It's just over because that piece of paper does not translate to the experience. Unless you make decisions on what that piece of paper says, I would rather, and I probably get people listening now, you know, want to blow holes in this statement, but I would rather go out of business offering an incredible experience and product than die a slow death offering a, a lackluster experience sure. and a shitty product. Sure. I just would. I, I, all businesses are complex, and I have respect for all entrepreneurs. But I got to say, like my respect for restaurateurs is like w the complexity of the business with regards to, you know, what you put on someone's plate and the margin to the mood to the to, like just everything. And with the margins, like to me, that is one of the hardest businesses. Not to mention like the lease. <laughs> I mean, I think, I th look, I, I, I've, I've, that's all I know, so I don't really know any other business, but I think all businesses have their, their, like, their niche challenge that is probably the bottleneck that makes the good ones work and the bad ones not, pretty sure. quickly. The that's filter fair. is like, the filter, it's like, and then some just, just don't make it through, right? Sure. I, I, I this, this, this friend of mine the other day said something when we were walking on the street and she was like, you know, you know, look how poor that guy is. All he's got is money. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> that like made me, I was like, I smiled inside when I heard that because I know that the money piece of success is actually ineffective. Mm -hmm. There's a level of comfort for sure, and we all want to be able to go out for a nice dinner and you know live in a nice place and sure. you know have a nice vehicle, but it doesn't bring joy. Right. You know, like taking my son snowboarding on Sunday for the first time ever <laughs> and watching him actually snowboard, I'll never experience joy like that. Like sure. it, it brings emotion to my body when I just say it. <laughs> that's that's that is you can't buy anything close to that. Hundred percent. You know, so all right. So now, so now you're in college and, and you're yep. and you're playing basketball and you're and I'm assuming you're like a junior when your father passes. So I was actually I was 
at prep school. So I did an extra year oh, okay. at Northfield Mount Hermon. So he passed away when I was 19. So that led to my, uh, I would say, overconsumption of, of alcohol in many ways at, at Columbia. I have the exact uh, same experience. Yeah. Probably. And uh, so, you know, got out, trader, paid off, was able to pay off the debt. 9-11 happened and, you know, started thinking about other things and led me to invest and be involved in a healthcare startup. And that led me to, to move. I moved to Washington, D.C., and I was there for two and a half years. Uh, didn't work out, um, but, like, it got me on the entrepreneurial journey and started, started another company didn't, on my own this time. Didn't work. And what actually, was that? It was, it was a, I, it was a, I had a low-carb mail-order cheesecake <laughs> that actually... I learned so much from the business. This, I was, love this was 2003, no, 2003 or four. Um, it was basically D to C e com. The packaging was so, it ended up being like a holiday product. And so I basically it was feast or famine according to the holidays. And like I worked so hard, but it just wasn't, I wasn't going to make anything. And I was like, I'm just doing everything. Um, you knew when to cut the line. Yeah, and I gave myself. I always think it's important to have like an end date and a goal. And like, I need. Sometimes I think it's okay to say to like, look, I, I just need something to happen. Like, I'm not going to throw out a number or something. Like, I need to see something by this date. Mm. I don't know what it is, but we need some real positive uptick here. I need an honest conversation with myself about this. I need to see something that's going to lead me to believe this. This thing is has a great legs. thing. Can you get, can you shed a little light on this? So I think that this is a really important, a really important message, right? Like going through that experience and um, and and actually cutting the cord. Yeah. Um, can you give some advice on people that are out there living that right now, where they're just like, I just need something to happen. Like, yeah. What what kind of advice would you give to someone out there that's just that's just either too afraid or their ego's in the way or they sure. just. Well, it's two things. I think one, you need to make sure that like you're all in, because I think some people are not kind of all in, and then they're looking for something, and then it's just this sort of vicious cycle that doesn't go anywhere. So in that process, the business really wasn't making enough, where I said, I'm going to do everything I can. I went and moved back home to live in like with my mother at age 30, which was like, my friends were like, what are you doing? Like, I was like, I felt like George Costanza, you know, <laughs> moving home, like the whole thing. Like, and I did it. I was like, from a business, this is the right thing to do because I need to, I, I had the decision, I could just keep on trading a little bit and making money. And I was like, I need to stop that because I'll never be able to let it go because it was drug. a crutch. Yeah. And this is going to be painful. <laughs> but like, you know, sometimes, sometimes you got to like tear down the house to build a new one. So... It's like, by the way, Gary Vee says that that's like the first thing you should do. You got to do it. And so I did it and it was painful. And, and that was, I lived at home for like three years. It was like brutal. Like it, I just, it didn't feel good. And I didn't, and then, and so that business ultimately didn't work. Uh, but to like your, your question, I, look, I think for everyone, it's important to pick something and it's got to be something real. You know, I, if there's a number out there, pick it, but I think in early stages of business, people fall in love with numbers and can look at them in the wrong way or pick something that's unattainable, but like whether it's like, you know, I need a new line of business or something. I need or, or something to happen that's like moving the business forward in some sort of meaningful way. Mm -hmm. Something. And, and uh, that's what it came to and I had a date. And I, I think also for, you don't want to be the entrepreneur who walks away too early where it becomes, you know, later in life, oh man, I should have just stuck it out and something you always regret. You want to know whatever it is in life, just like walking away, whether it's a relationship, you know, and often being an entrepreneur, you have a relationship with your business. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a personal relationship. You need to walk, in my opinion, you need to walk away saying, I need to know I gave it everything and it just wasn't meant to be and that's okay because you need to get to that place where you can mentally walk away from it because if you're not there, you know, odds are you're probably gonna try to start something else or do something else. You need that mental break, otherwise it'll just scar you and ruin the next thing. And so, 
Cool. You know, then I was part of a an organic chocolate chip cookie company that was in every Whole Foods in the country. So I've been to like 200 Whole Foods. Um, long story short, that did not work. Although it had all the makings of success. That I think there was a, something though, like I go back to luck and timing. Um, we got, like when we launched that company, there was also I think like a 45% uh, price increase in organic ingredients and mm -hmm. got hit by the so like the timing of everything and part of me is like oh like I should have st stuck that one out but at any rate it was through that business trying to raise money in the worst time ever like 2008 2007 eight yeah exactly sky was falling <coughs> uh, I was flying a ton and I'm like I, I flew over a hundred thousand miles domestic uh, I was flying coach I'm six seven like me in a coach seat not pretty. And then the stress of that, and I had an old basketball injury in my lower back. So like, I, I had two extruded discs in my lower back, L4, L5, S1, pressing on my sciatic nerve. Mm, so I had excru I know that's all excruciating about. pain in my right leg. I couldn't walk. I went to, went to a doctor. He said, you know, you need back surgery. And I was like, nothing against surgery, but I'm going to see a second opinion. Success rates with back surgery aren't that great. Just ask Steve Kerr. Um, so sought a second opinion, that doctor said the same thing. He said, you know what, you need back surgery. And it was almost like an afterthought. He said, maybe some yoga or therapy um, might help. And so at the time, um, my then girlfriend, now wife, uh, co-founder and co-CEO Colleen was into yoga. So I was like, you know what, I'll, I'll try a little yoga. So started like five minutes, 10 minutes, morning, evening, light yoga, started to feel better. I was like, wow. That, like." this is amazing. And, and for me, it was a can of worms where I started to look at stress, sleep, nutrition. I was a guy whose idea of nutrition back then was steak and martinis at the Palm Steakhouse. I, I am on the wall of the West Side Palm next to Adam Sandler and Joe Namath. That's how much steak and martinis Are you? I, I am to this day. <laughs> so you could see me at age 27. Like gotcha. that's, that I'm immortalized on the wall at age 27 next to Adam Sandler and Joe Namath. Um, still eat meat, just not as much. Mm -hmm. Started to focus on vegetables, look at inflammation, started to look at you know, the environment, toxins, and that role. And so through that process, I made a lot of changes in my life, and yoga was a big part of it. Uh, over the course of six months, I went from like, I could not walk to being fine. And so I, to this day, I never had back surgery. No and cortisone so, shot, nothing? No, I tried that, it failed. So when you say extruded, extruded disc, was it like a ruptured disc? Or it wasn't something? ruptured, extruded. So it's just out. Okay, so it's, it's out. just okay, out gotcha. pressing on the nerve. So like ruptured is where it was like varying degrees. See, it's crazy. I had rupture in L4, L5, Ooh. and there was a fragment of disc that landed on my sciatic nerve, Ooh. and I could not walk, period. Everybody told me I needed surgery, and I did all sorts of witch doctor stuff. And then... How do you feel? I'm fine. Oh, see? Like, I get chronic, like, it'll creep up, but I squat, you know, 315 pounds, deadlift, like heavy, heavy weight. I don't do that. <laughs> but like that, but you know, like that, it's so crazy. Back injuries are so, because, you know, they, like most doctors will look at you and say, oh, you need surgery. Yeah. You, you well, that's what they absolutely do. It's need like surgery. you go to a butcher and you say, like, I need to cut the, it's the right. same thing. That's what they do. I need, you need surgery. Yeah. And like 50% of those back surgeries. Yeah, the success rates aren't good. Yeah. And so, so like the silver lining, it was through that experience. It was like, wow, like everyone's got wellness wrong. Everyone thinks it's about like, you know, vanity and weight loss. And like, yeah, sure, that's part of, that's not it. It's about mental, physical, spiritual, emotional, and environmental well-being. And all these things are connected. Mind, body, green. One word, not three. And so that led me to be the, found mind, body, green with the idea of like, hey, no one's talking about this in an inclusive way, anything that was a little Eastern holistic just spoke to the, you know, preach the choir of the west side of LA or Brooklyn or Boulder. Uh, nothing was nuanced, nothing, as we say here, like connected soul with science. And like, there's an opportunity to, to, to talk to people about this lifestyle and build a company around it. And that's how it all started. And when so, was that? So the, the, we, we officially launched with content in September of 2009. So like, and then in that journey, I could talk about, like, we didn't, I said to Colleen, give me, like, six months, I can figure this out. We just got married. Uh, we moved to New York, back to New York. I was in San Francisco with her. Uh, she started a job. 
And it's like, give me six months, I'll figure it out. So like, I had no salary. Six months became, we didn't start, to give you an idea of the growth of the site, we didn't, we didn't reach 100,000 people in January 2011, 500,000 in 2012, and then ultimately in the millions a couple years later. I didn't start, the first time I paid myself was in mid, like around in, in 2012. So wow. I went through almost three years without a salary. You hear that? Which was very, again, like very blessed and very fortunate that I had an incredibly supportive wife and mm -hmm. who also like was involved and would write on nights and weekends, but like that was stressful. That was a very, early, that, was a, that was a real palpable stress on like an early marriage, especially when I was like, I go back to the timing, then give me six months. <laughs> and then three so years later, if I look at like the, you know, the journey of being an entrepreneur and like today the business is, you know, we're great. It's 20, it's going to be 2020. I left Wall Street in officially like in 2003 or four. And then the, my buddy Green wasn't like deemed maybe successful to like 13, 14. That's a long so if I say, like, people will say, like, oh, the brand's so years. big, 10 years. So it was all this journey. Mm. So. Would you have it any other way? No. You know, I, I'm, I'm not the, the type of person who, who looks back and all, it, it, it made me who I am. It made the business. I believe in timing and, and luck and fortune and there's something so greater So what do you guys play, do? What do you guys do at My Body Green? So today we, we, we publish free content. So we have amazing content on everything, all the subjects we, we've talked about, everything, you know, mindfulness, meditation, yoga, food, nutrition, functional medicine, the environment, relationship, you name it, we have it, all the stuff that's good for you. So we've got free content. We've got a podcast, which you've been on. I you love that podcast. Your, it's a great podcast. I You're love podcast. you got a good story. <laughs> Very good story. Um, we have over 60 classes that, that, so everything from classes on relationships to we have a functional nutrition program with every great functional medicine doctor who none of us can see. Mm -hmm. uh, that's amazing, 20 hours of content. Uh, we have events, we have amazing revitalized events. We do local events. We're doing a big event here in New York in September. I'll talk to you about. Um, and then the latest one is we, we just launched products with the supplement line, which is another personal crazy health story. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so like in, you know, as, as I mentioned, my father died of heart disease at 46. So in my early 40s, you know, I wanted to, you know, I have two little girls. Our kids are about the same age. I've got a three-year-old and a six-month-old. and just want to be, look out for for. for potential health road, roadblocks sure. and knowing that that's a potential issue. I have access to all these amazing doctors. So Frank Littman's one of them. So I went to Frank and said like, can we get more sophisticated beyond like cholesterol, which is still an important marker to look at, but like there are other, other markers you should look at for heart disease. So did an extensive panel, everything more or less normal. And one marker, homocysteine came back high, to give you an idea of how homocysteine should be under 15, over 15 is considered high. Uh, high homocysteine is, it can be linked to clotting and you can go as far as catastrophic clotting. So like stroke, like pulmonary embolisms, like not, could, could be potentially catastrophic. So 15 is high, he calls me and he says, uh, I think your lab's a mistake, take it again. I was like, what's the number? He said 63. So I was, I was like, oh, okay, I'll take it again. I take it again, no mistake. And so I'm like, Frank, what do, what do I do? I feel fine. Uh, you know, is there, and I'm not opposed to surgery or medication, or anything. is there surgery, is there medication? What, what do I do? He said, no, it's actually a, a cocktail of B vitamins I need to put you on right now. And like, he messengered them over. So I'm like, this is, and I, I didn't have the time to like Google at the time. So then I'm, I'm like, Googling Google. after, I'm like, oh, holy shit. Uh, so, I went from 63 to 23 in about 40 days, and then eventually to 12. And then when I've gone off them, it's gone up. And so I take a, so like very, I was like, oh, so I was like, wow. So like, you're gonna have to take them? I, for the rest of my life, yeah. And, and it's, 
Is it a genetic thing? Yeah, so I have the I'm MTHF, MTHFR and C677T, so like genetically, but there's something else going on. It's just like some people have things and I have this thing and I just gotta take a supplement. So at any rate, I've always believed in supplements, but my belief became a lot greater. And it began this process where Colleen and I said like, wow, like I had something potentially life threatening. Like what are, what are other issues that other people are facing, you know, whether it's anxiety, sleep, uh, beauty, longevity, like, and could we provide real solutions? So it was this two year process where, you know, I, I'm the guy now who does labs every quarter and I watch everything um, and started to look around and it became clear that we could really provide solutions for people that worked. And we partnered with Thorne, who's, who's been in the supplement industry forever and is known for their quality and testing. I learned all this stuff about the industry, like testing, like things get compromised. Like I, my eyes were open. It became clear they were just an unbelievable partner and shared our values for purity and efficacy. And so we created a line which we just launched. So whether it's we've got a probiotic, which we're the only brand in the world with these four strains designed specifically for bloating. like. If you have a bloating problem, take it. If you don't, don't. We have an amazing sleep product where I was someone who never really struggled with sleep, but I didn't know how good sleep could be. Colleen, my wife, has chronic sleep problems, like like prescription drug, like chronic, like it's she changed it. her life. We take it every night. You gotta send me some. I will, I'll give you some <laughs> after this. And so I could go, and then we have a, a longevity product like that actually has a lot of anti-wrinkle benefits. I have less wrinkles from my eyes today too than I had a year ago. Do you? Yeah, I do. And I'm not getting to sleep with, with the little ones. Um, and so and so on, like we created this line, which we're super proud of, which was just out there. And so for us, it was like, hey, like people are really struggling and, and I've struggled with these things. I take every product. Colleen and I have been taking them for months. And as a brand, you know, ultimately we're about helping people live their happiest, healthiest lives. And so we do that digitally with content and events and now took two years to, we work with uh, a functional medicine doctor, Bob Roundtree at Thorne, like on every product for a two year process to make sure everything was like the best it could possibly be. So that's finally out. That's amazing, man. Congrats. Yeah, thank you. So I just want to point out a few things before we wrap up. Um, so you had, you took some blood work, you had high levels of homocysteine, homocysteine and that propelled you to not like just try to get your health back into shape or where you felt comfortable, even though you weren't feeling uncomfortable, you knew that there was this elevated number that made you uncomfortable based yeah. on your family history. You got it back. You weren't like, oh my God, thank gosh, I'm back into health. You were like, I'm going to go create a, a supplement company. Well, I didn't even think about, like, I, it, wasn't, it wasn't like this straight line where, like, we got to do something. It was like, wow, like, holy, like. What I'm saying uh, is, is that what it, I'm it was, it was an organic process. It right. was an organic process, and but I, most people wouldn't I, do that. I, I turned a uh, lemon into lemonade. But what I'm saying <laughs> that's the, that is an entrepreneur. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, sure. and, and 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 so when we started out, you know, you you fired back uh, both, right, born and made, and I and I actually I agree, right? Like I don't think you are. Um, I think it is a combination of both if you are born with it. Sure. If you're not born with it, I don't think you get it. And I, and I don't want to, and it's so, dis, it's tough for me because I, I, I feel like that's like somewhat discouraging for people out there that are, you know, it's very cool to be an entrepreneur today. Uh, absolutely. It's, it's, it's one of those like, um, you know, sort of like anti-system things to do, right? Like, I'm going to go out and do what I know I can do. Well, I think, you know, for me personally, like, I can't feign, I can't feign, like, pretend to be passionate or, like, fake it. Like, I, I remember Quentin Tarantino saying that once in an interview. Like, he's like, I can't, I can't, like, feign interest. It's like, either I'm in or I'm out. And I think with, with, with entrepreneurs, with me, like, I can't not think this way. Like, I cannot stop obsessing or thinking about the next thing. So I think like the, the question that people have to ask are like, would it kill you not to do it? Like if, if it would kill you, like it's probably like, it's in your blood, it's in you. So you're saying porn? I think for, but at the same time, 
to be successful, I think it's the muscles. You know, we talk about adversity, ambiguity, because sure. like a lot of things, like people are super passionate. Like it kills me not to do this, and but they're not real. It's more of a hobby. I think there's a potentially a. So I think you need both. Like I think I think what would what sort of like would sort of clarify this question is there's a, a super successful C, founder CEO of a company. Somebody comes in as his assistant or her assistant, and that person finds that sees that that person is just awesome and wants to wing that person, bring that person up with them. However, that person doesn't have the same drive, passion, or ambition right. that that CEO founder has because mm -hmm. that CEO founder is a true entrepreneur and this person is coming in as that person's admin. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's possible to make that admin that CEO founder um, if that admin is not born with like an inherent ability to want to continue to push no matter how hard it is. And I think, and I think that is what an entrepreneur is, 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 is there's like this fearless element that like, you know, if there's a cliff in front of you and there's a very good chance that you're going to die, you're just like, you want it and you're so passionate about it that yeah. you're just willing to take that leap when, you know, the 95 people behind you are like, that person's crazy. Yeah. You know, I think that there is that. I think that that, and, and I know I have that. I know that I have this, like, there's not a, you know, like, I, you know, I, I just did a deal with my partner at Seymour's to, 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 to make him much more of an equity shareholder than I am. And there was a real piece of me that wanted to be like, man, I should just, like, chill for a couple of months. Like, I have the ability to just, like, kick back and, like, really just spend, you know, spend more time on the, the more enjoyable Go things in life. With yeah, your son, you know. Yeah. And I'm like, I just can't do it, you know. Right. I just can't do it. And so I, I agree with you. I think, you know, you, there, I think that you, I would argue to say that you're born with it, you know. And then if you don't hone it and sharpen it, you, chances of you succeeding in it are slimmer. Mm -hmm. However, I don't, I think that there is a difference between entrepreneurs and non-entrepreneurs. Yeah, I agree. It, you got it, it's got to kill you not to do it. It, it really does. And you know, I, I also know that knowing who I am, I just couldn't work at a desk job. Nothing wrong. It's just I couldn't. I couldn't do it. It's not who I am. <laughs> and it's again, it's knowing who you are. And I think that's it's who you are, and it's also experiences over time. Thank you very much for joining us, man. Thank you. Honor to be here. Um, folks, Jason Wackup, that was awesome. Thank you very, 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 very much. Thank you. Awesome. We went a little over. Cool? They stopped listening to us. <laughs> um, that was great. Sorry, man. I went long. No, no. Dude. They, you know. It's, it's, We're it's, like, it's go great. way back.